Hello, I'm Peter Miller. I'm Dean of the Bard Graduate Center, uh, and I'm here with Charlotte Vignon and Barry Bergdahl. Charlotte is the director of the Musée National de Ceramique uh, at Sèvres, and she came to Sèvres from uh, the Frick Collection in New York, where she was curator of decorative arts for 10 years. Before that, uh, she was a curator and a fellow at the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her field of work is the history of collecting, and she wrote a book a very important book on Joseph Duveen and the art market around 1900. Uh, and while she was in New York, she was a professor at the Bard Graduate Center and remains on its board of trustees. The other person we'll be talking with today is Barry Bergdahl, who is the Meyer Shapiro Professor of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University, where he's been uh, for his whole career, except for a brief stint at the Museum of Modern Art, where he was head of the design department. He works on architectural history from 1750 to the present, mostly in Germany and France, but uh, uh, actually with projects that take him all across uh, the globe. Uh, and he has been very involved with the BGC for almost its whole, uh, whole lifespan, sitting on its board of trustees for at least 20 years, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you both very much for, uh, for joining us. A simple question to start, uh, and one where I think both of you are uh, ideally placed to answer. Um, how would you describe the contribution of the BGC to scholarship on decorative arts, design history, material culture? Uh, and I'm thinking of the exhibitions, I'm thinking of the alumni who've gone off to work in museums and in academia, and the various publications of the institution. Uh, Charlotte, would you like to begin? So for me, I think the, the main, uh, really the strengths of the institution and the, the biggest impact was actually to put the subject on the map, to, to really to focus and to have one uh, institution, to have a, a master and PhD program that, that focus exclusively on uh, the, the history of decorative art, the study of decorative art and the history of design. So that I think set apart from the beginning uh, the, this, uh, this institution. So that's my very short answer, Barry might want to take uh, on and uh, I can uh, come back after if, you, if necessary. You know, as a historian, I'm always a little bit um, nervous about trying to write a history of the immediate, the immediate past and particularly something that I at least participated in in various guises, even if a little bit to the edge of the um, growth of the BGC. Um, so I wonder if this will hold up in our conversation, but it seems to me that the BGC both um, rode a wave, but like a surfer rode a wave very early and therefore had an impact on that wave. It's a bad metaphor, but in any case, what I see as a, a kind of a blurring of the, a very productive blurring of the boundaries between art historical studies and historical studies. So we might say between different disciplines within uh, humanities and social sciences uh, that had tended to look at the same objects from very different uh, points of view. And inevitably, I think as Charlotte uh, is suggesting as well, to really give um, sort of legitimacy to the study of what used to be called either the minor arts or the useful arts or the decorative arts, all tags that were meant somehow to put the practices that the BGC looks at in a different category uh, from the fine arts. So also I think to in a little bit trouble the placement or the, um, the fixity uh, of the lines between different artistic practices. Okay. Um... Why do you think, I mean, you mentioned the wave, uh, Barry. Why do you think that there has been, let's say in the last 20 years or so, uh, I, I, let's call it a new interest, but let's, we can certainly say increasing interest in things material uh, and the meaningfulness of things, whether with professors, museums, popular literature. Why, why do you think, I mean, do you have any, any sense from your different vantage points um, and in different countries, why there has been this interest in things? I yeah. could, yeah, I could, go ahead, Charlotte. I could certainly no, no, float some hypotheses. 
I, I, I think it's a more general movement uh, that is the new generation and us, the new generation force us also, the oldest generation to think differently. Uh, and with the interest of our world as going so fast and so quickly in recent years, and especially with the digital that is so abstract, I have the feeling around me that there is a sense, desire of focusing, recentering on, on, on object, on patrimony, on greens, on, on, on a planet, on, on simple things in a way, on objects. So I think it's, this, uh, I, I, it's a global uh, phenomenon that make us want and desire to understand where we come from our history uh, and, and learn it from the objects, this interest on also on all of the garbage and things that we threw away and that we keep. The, the, again, this green movement of the youth, I think um, make us, um, yeah, focus and be interested in all objects. The one is in museum, the one that surround us, the one we threw away, the one that bother us. And uh, so that's my, my quick answer. Mm. All right. Yeah, it's a it's a very simple question for a very complicated phenomena. But I, I, I agree with Charlotte. I think in many ways, it's a type of reaction formation. Um, I, as a historian, primarily of the years on either side of 1800, I think of the phenomena of the incredible rise of historical consciousness after the French Revolution. So I think also Charlotte is pointing to this notion that somehow some of these interests are meant to come from anxieties about changes in the present and very rapid uh, changes. Part of it, of course, I think is the digital so that as everything becomes more and more immaterial, there is a counter movement uh, towards a fascination with the uh, material, uh, whether it's for a sense of loss or whether it's because these objects seem to be slipping into the, into the past. I think that's one part of it. Um, I think there are other, uh, either related phenomena or subsets of that. Uh, and I think we feel it, of course, much more intensely as we're having this conversation in a very uh, dematerialized or despatialized, if you will, um, uh, format. And I very much wonder what the lasting effects will, of, of this will be on what I just, your question prompts me to think about, but not for the first time which is why is there such a thirst for going to museums? Why have we found museums not to be places anymore of quiet contemplation, but of absolute crowd invasion in recent years? One of the reasons too why it's maybe so difficult to reopen them because there are places where it's very difficult to disaggregate people. But I think that phenomena that we saw uh, up until early uh, March uh, throughout the world has much to do with a, First of all, a large public desire for authenticity. And so I think the, ma the material turn in academic studies is also related to a popular desire for a, a tactile relationship to the, to the world um, as part of it. I think maybe if we ask this question 20 years from now, or we ask people who weren't alive right, who weren't working right now as we're working and can see us from some distance, I wonder if they will see this as part of a, a kind of long durée that goes back to the previous generation's turn in art history to the so-called institutional turn. So along with it, fascination with the institutions where things live. So simultaneously, the material aspects of life, but also the institutions in which they grow, uh, separated from you know, an older art history, an older material uh, culture history that was fascinated with names and makers and individuals operating outside of structure. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, with, you know, with the perspective of looking back at the, the art market in places like New York and London in 1900 through Duveen's lens, do you also see this question of the, the importance of things for people as a way of asking about changing attitudes to the role of the museum in society? Yes, I think it's, um, I mean, the, the, the object that I studied around the art market at that period of time, I think it's 
each period will have a, a different uh, look and understanding and a, um, acceptation and appropriation of the objects and each class also. And around the in the art market, the object that I study were uh, a social appropriation in a way. This object became social vectors of uh, a desire to be or to be someone else, to create the cause, to reinvent uh, ourselves. So I think it's it just, um, and they were outside the museum world. They were uh, on the market and they went to private houses. So I, I think that's a little bit different, but I would like to go back to uh, what uh, Barry just said about the role of museums um, that I think has really this crisis uh, all over the world has really make us think differently of these institutions and also about the object within and why uh, is it so important for people to be connected with them and this needs of reopening or not. And I think the, like our, your institution, the BGC or our institution, the BGC or, or museum are changing uh, uh, and relatively rapidly and are probably changed. I don't know if you feel about that, Peter, but us, we are thinking that our museums will not be bef the same before and after that crisis. And we need to respond to that needs of, of the public, what they're looking for in an object, uh, in a museum, in our museum, and how we can respond to it. So I think uh, your teaching, uh, the next couple of years, uh, the relationship you will have with your student would probably have to be slightly different, or at least we need to think about it, of, of how we can readjust to, to this new need uh, of, of, I thought that the museum can actually close for a couple of years, uh, months, not years, months. Why not? But actually, no, it's not possible because we need to be there for the public We need to be there and have this connection with objects. So we have this social impact. We need to, we are reassurance of uh, a certain life uh, that keep going on. Uh, museums are open, churches as op are open. We are part of this uh, landscape of the city that is a reassurance for the public. Even if they don't go in, they know the museum is open and it's important. Do you see what I mean? So I, it's it's we there is a role that is definitely changing and evolving and i don't think there is anybody has an answer right now but it's it's we need to respond to it and think about it does uh does the kind of theatricalization of the museum yeah. bother you a little bit i mean it's great that people like to go to museums and and one could certainly say better to go to a museum for the wrong reasons so to speak because there's still the opportunity to learn things, but um, you know, in terms of in terms of the training of the next generation, you know, there's a tension surely between the museum as a cultural resource and trying to serve that purpose, and and I won't even say responsibility to the collection, though a generation ago that's the way it would have been presented. But let's say a, a responsibility to research. And those are very different kinds of, of, um, of perspectives. Yeah, and, and, and for many, many years, the object, the reason of a museum or even a university to study object was that it was to do research, to, uh, to learn about them. And now it's not exclusively the role. And I think that to think about further about the BGC or any university now, you need also to train this generation of young students who are going to need to respond to objects either on the art market or in a museum or in university that have multiple roles. So it uh, it's, could be the experience, it could be the feeling. Yes, there is this sense of theatricality, but that means the people inside the museum need to play with that and respond to that needs. So the people who go into museums field need to be ready and prepared to think about these questions. So it, it became very complex and very interesting, but we are not anymore the keepers of a collection. We are not only studying objects uh, to to learn about them, to write about them to a certain field. Now it's much broader. 
uh, and, uh, and as professional, we need to be ready. And you, as a university or as a place where we learn about objects, you need also to provide all of these different palettes of, uh, of response and different perspective that we can have around objects. So that brings me perfectly to my final question, which, which will go right from there. And that is, you've been associated with the institution for a long time, and you've had careers outside uh, in museums and other, uh, other universities. <clears throat> what do you think the BGC could do with and for its students that it doesn't do now or hasn't done until now? Um, you know, in the last couple of years, we added a digital literacy requirement, we added a new writing requirement, because we think both of those are important and still important uh, in the world to come, as long as uh, there is communication that happens. Uh, and we have had our various requirements for historical surveys, for methodology surveys, language requirements, uh, requirement to work in the world through an internship to get a sense of how ideas in the classroom look in the real world, so to speak. What kinds of things do you think, you know, we could do, stuff that you've seen tried in other places or which you've always imagined you would like to see uh, included in the training of students? Barry, do you want to start this? I'll take a, I'll take a stab at it. I think it's a tough one. Plus, it's a, the, your second question was already so interesting. I have a lot of lingering uh, thoughts running through my mind from what Charlotte just said. Maybe I can try to tie them together. Um, I suppose this is going to be the obvious answer from an architectural historian who then was a museum curator for the impossible notion of architecture in the museum, although the museum is of course inherently an architecture, so that's a very interesting problem in its own right. Um, I think I've always wanted to see more at the BGC of an inclusion of architecture, but not simply as a subject matter, uh, but we might say the counterpart to uh, a really important contribution to how we understand things, material things, objects, and the making of them, again, as central to our study, rather than as illustrations of ideas. But the complement to it, I think, is space. And that is the, the thing I always think in art, history curriculums that architectural historians try to bring is that we are the analysts of visual experience whose evidence is as much in spatial configurations as it is in physical materiality. Not that those two can ever be separated from one another entirely. Um, but I think that you can extend this idea of bringing uh, the spatial into the training of students in every way from intellectual understanding of how objects work in space, but also those social spaces that we're all eager to get back to. Why is the museum a success? It's be because it just operates continually trying to deal with the conflict between the protection of objects uh, and the creation of spaces in which people view objects. Um, so I think thinking about those uh, within the curriculum would be important, but I also think that the making of exhibitions is a spatial practice uh, and the understanding of um, the spatiality of the way that a historian, a curator, a, if you will, a, a theatrical performer, we were, you were asking us about theatricalization earlier and I was thinking back to Alexandre Lenoir and the birth of the museum and he came out of the world of the theater. There's always been a theatrical aspect to the relatively young institution of the museum. But I think uh, teaching students to think and to work spatially, even bring in some of the practices of studio architecture into uh, the work of training people who might like to express themselves through curatorial practice uh, would be uh, a wonderful enhancement to a curriculum that um, I think under all of your guidances is continually questioning itself, which is very healthy, but that's the one thing I can, I can think of that I would want to push if I were there on 86th Street with you, but I'm not even sure you're on 86th Street. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is in front of it. Speaking about spa spatial reality and not reality, right. <laughs> we, he is, he is on, for us, he is on front of it. 
I think it's, yeah, I, it's a very, very, very good suggestion. Mine would be, I'm very pragmatic, and I've seen many of the students at the BGC um, and working with them, and I think there is two aspects now. It's, they need jobs, we all know that. And they all wanted my job. They all want to be curator of decorative arts in, you know, or in design in one of the top museums. And they are tough and there are very few of them. But around, you know, and after you're training also academics. And again, and you, we know how tough that field is. But around it, and maybe now because the museum or the art world has such an impact and such an important place, or in, in the world, there's many, many other jobs. The art market is tough right now and will be tough for many years, but it, it's very much alive. And what I, there is museum education. That is actually, there is always more educator than there is a curator. So and they are very important and relevant job and play a very important role of how um, the, 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 the role of the curator, we cannot be everywhere, but and we're working with educator of how to 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 talk and speak and and write uh, um, to to a larger public, and I think that what the BGC can do it's actually um, maybe to form better people that will go on the art market, learn uh, the job of how to value and to appraise things that there is a class that they can. Sometimes they don't even know about, it's a totally different job, but maybe there could be something working with dealers, appraisers. And, and another one uh, to train more museum educators is like the teaching uh, that you offer at the BGC is of the highest uh, level. And they, your student talk at the end of their um, study is very well and right, much better than when they started. But it's also interesting, I think, uh, especially when they go to the museum world, that you don't always address to academic and academician and write, you know, papers, but you should have the same ideas that you can diffuse or, or express to a child or to the general public. And I think if they can learn how to continue to be extremely smart uh, and have a very sophisticated idea, but to express them on a very different level. Well, as I said, as I have one idea, you need to be able to express to a child, to a, in class, to students, to trustees, and to the general public. You know, it's all the, the palette of, and that go back to the point that I said earlier, is the fact that now museum, our a cultural institution, uh, are touching so many different levels, and I think the BGC should be ready to form also um, uh, students to be ready to, to, to take their role in, in that very large palette uh, of, of, of uh, uh, art activities or cultural um, activities or, or jobs around, around the world. Um, is, it, is it clear? Yeah, I mean, I think I like the fact that each of you offers very distinct complementary um, ideas, the space studies, and the attention to the more practical elements and kind of the interstitial communication between the academic world and, uh, and, the, and the public, really. Um, I think we're doing some of the latter much more now. There's much more intense uh, conversation between the research events and events for the public. So we did a series of conversations in the fall uh, sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation on what is research. It was actually run by, by and for the public programs, but had a, a, serious, um, a serious subject that academics could relate to. And there are lots of academics in the audience as well. And a bunch of our students now are, are getting jobs in education departments. Um, right. So that is happening. But I think when it comes to the space element and architecture as a, a window into or a framework in which to consider the, the, the matter, but also the environments in which matter is deployed. I think that is something that we could do much more of. And I think there was, you know, in the early days of the institution, I think there was a certain degree of marking the terrain against 
art history or against architectural history. And I think, you know, with the passage of time and a certain degree of, of success and, and self-confidence, there's less of a need for that kind of drawing of boundaries. So I think, um, I think it's a very timely suggestion um, to start thinking about that. I, I, think, I think it is extremely timely. I mean, I think we're having this conversation and this week, of course, once it enters into the internet, it doesn't necessarily have such a date stamp on it, but this is the week in which people, even at the peril of their own health, are coming out of isolation and to reoccupy urban space to protest racial injustice and social injustice. And so even this is incredibly spatial. Um, and I think just to add to the, um, the palette of skills that students coming out of the BGC have in order uh, to, to read society past and present, um, you know, one of the big uphill battles for all art historians without demarcating any lines between the terrain that the BGC expands and the terrain that might have been inherited uh, is that we, we learn to think visually in a culture which despite the bombardment of visuality is still very textually based and education is very textually based. And you're keenly aware of that. That's what you think about in terms of the curriculum of the, of the BGC. But I would say that the, the spatiality of that visual experience is another, is another dimension that I think is very, very important to underscore. And, um, you know, it goes to precisely the poignancy of this moment when uh, we are isolated from shared spaces. Uh, and yet the, uh, the way to express something beyond the individual is in fact to, to reconquer. Uh, that very space from which we removed ourselves. You know, that's very, that's very beautifully put. I mean, I'm thinking about you know, the earlier conversation when Charlotte brought up the point about the role of the museum in society today. In a way, uh, up until this week, the run of the sort of the COVID commentary was about the crisis of cities. You know, the cities, how will they function in the future? The places of contagion and plague, will property values go down, will businesses move out? And in a week, right? In a week, we see that there, it's, it, it's impossible to express a crucial element of our humanity without this kind of stage that the city provides, right? Precisely the, um, the density, the concentration, the friction of the city is so generative for all sorts of things. We know that. Um, I mean, I wonder if you think that there will be a kind of renewed interest in the city that emerges from this very strange six months that we've had and which may go on for much longer. I'm not so sure there'll be, I, I'd like to think that we've had a temporary lapse of imagining that uh, because a privileged people like myself can retreat to the countryside in order to be safe. But I'm from Philadelphia, so I'm thinking back of how uh, the wealthy in Philadelphia built houses for themselves way up the Schuylkill River so that when the yellow fever season came, they could remove themselves from the city. And I keep thinking about that because the city has gone on and grown and gone through other crises. Um, I do think that what we've, we've seen is the, uh, the hunger for sociability and the hunger for spontaneity and the hunger for interaction uh, with people that we don't know. I don't think that a, a, a world for many years in which we exist in, in totally self-selected pods, which seems to be the sort of temporary solution to uh, contagion. And it's incredible that the, the temporary solution to contagion would be precisely a absolute hyperbolic uh, atomization of society, which is precisely at the root of many of the problems that we're confronting in the manifestation of inequities uh, on, the, on the streets right now and across the... So I, I'm not sure if there'll be... A, I, I'd like to think that the temporary victimization of the city, 
uh, will true will prove to be as much of a um, let's say a fiction as the victimization of Donald Trump. You know, neither, neither of these are in fact really uh, victims. The city, I think, will reemerge. The big question in our minds is uh, how will it change? How will it change socially? How will it change uh, uh, physically? And to reinforce my appeal for spatial studies, uh, you'll notice that the one of the handful of uh, uh, brand new terms that have been uh, coined in uh, the last couple of months, almost all those terms are spatial, whether it be the idea of social distancing, which is a weird term because in fact we're really physically distancing, but mm -hmm. this, this new term is a spatial term. Uh, in, uh, if you are picking up, as I do, Many mornings, Le Monde, you've learned a brand new word in French, le déconfinement. This is not a word that existed before. So this is a spatial term as well. Uh, so, so much of this, uh, of our current uh, dilemma uh, is experience through, uh, through spatial experience or the deprivation of spatial experience. I really do think that there's going to emerge a real hunger for the city uh, as well as what's already underway in people's individual isolations and over Zoom, a very intense rethinking about what the city of the future could be. Mm. So this, but, the dystopia and utopia are, are joined at the moment. Yeah, and it make us think about uh, me, my last couple of weeks, I've been about the space also. It's how many people can fit and be healthy within a certain space. And we're trying within the museum and all of that to create movement with the architecture that exists of where we can be together, not be together, uh, cross each other, not that. And I think all of that make us look actually at the architecture completely differently. We're all in institution, at least in France, have map like the, of our building and uh, how many people can come in and out. So the population within the architecture has been you know, an enormous topic of conversation here. And so things that we have to think, which we didn't uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I'm gonna go way off program here. And, and um, but just this last point about thinking about the shell and how many people can be in there and imagining that for a city also. Um, and here's where I go off program. There's a really fantastic piece of uh, contemporary dance that debuted a couple of years ago called um, Paramodernities, which uh, is in six parts, basically looks at six classic pieces of choreography from Nijinsky up through, um, up through the present, Ailey, Cunningham, uh, Graham, uh, Fossey, uh, Balanchine. Um, but in the section on Nijinsky, and it's paired, it's a choreographer taking the choreography of these dances, chopping them up into steps, resorting them like digitally, and then um, setting them to a text written by an academic about the piece, the time, the place, et cetera, the ideas. And for the first one on choreography, it makes the point that, um, that there are these two different words for space, right? There's topos, which is uh, the abstract space of the XY grid. And then there is chora, which is a space made by people. And so choreography becomes the organization of people in space. And you know, at that point, you gotta wonder whether in the spatial studies of the future, we need choreographers to work with city planners and architects to imagine, back to Charlotte's image of people moving through a building, how to do that in a beautiful way, beauty including health. So, but I, I think it's, it's wonderful what you said and it kind of rebound, I'm rebounding to what we said earlier is to come back and refocusing on the program at the VGC is you need to prepare now. All of these young uh, uh, students that go into your program for future, uh, for the world, uh, the museum or cultural institutions or academics, to think about, and you need to anticipate, like six months ago, we didn't know, I was not prepared to think like that. 
And, and I think you what you can bring to the BGC, and that's why it's a, it's a wonderful idea, uh, what Barry suggested, is like to anticipate, anticipate what the world will need. And, and I think the broader you are, and actually the, 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 to think about space, it's actually a basic. I'm actually now completely shocked that it doesn't, it, it's not there already. Because, it, and, and we will have been able to think uh, and to adjust and react in a much more different way. We would have been prepared and, and thought about that. So it's, it, yeah, just include all of that in your program and you will prepare all of these students to face the issues that we will have to face in the future because it's going to come back and it's going to be more complicated and complex. And um, that's it. Okay, well, that's great. I think the two, of you, the two of you have given us wonderful ideas and it's been a fun conversation. I've been talking with Charlotte Mignon from SEB uh, and Barry Bergdahl out on the East End of Long Island. And uh, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you in real life, in three dimensions, before too long. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Peter. Thank you, Barry.